Good morning. What a joy it is to be here and to be blessed by your voices as we've lifted them up to God this morning. And I know that, that He and the angels are, are rejoicing with us and pleased beyond measure. I am excited about the theme. It's a wonderful life. Are you? Because I've spent all of my life in the context of the Lord's church. From, I guess, a week after I was born, my mama had me in, in church services. As many of you, that's true, though some of you came later in life. And you know the church goes through periods. It kind of has ages, like history does in its broader sense. But the church, you know, we go through times where we're very effective, and then we go through times where we feel like we're not that effective. And I think that we need a message of positivity in the churches of Christ in 2014. Amen. We really need a message of positivity. Because I, in some ways, I think that the events that are taking place in the world around us, in our society in particular, are stripping us not only of our confidence and instilling fear within us, but they're taking away our optimism in some ways. And it's, it's really not the world's fault. Because I, I, it, I marvel at the fact that, that when worldly people act worldly, we're shocked. I mean, isn't that strange? Don't be shocked by anything the world does. It doesn't really make any sense. When my dog acts like a dog, which can quite be frustrating, it doesn't surprise me, does it you? And, and, and not that we're insulting people in regard to dogs, but we're simply saying that the world... The Bible tells us very plainly that the world, it has its own prince. It is the prince of lies, the prince of the air. He is the prince of this world. The devil has a great deal of control in this world. And there is no level of wickedness, ungodliness, or perversion and that is beyond his scope. So we should not ever be surprised by worldly people acting worldly. But we are. And not only that, we don't just, we're not just shocked by it. We're not just surprised by it. We react to it. And some of the ways that we react, I think we need to hear this theme. And we don't just need to hear it here for a week. We need to take it home and insist that in our local pulpits, and our local Bible classes, in just the conversations in the hallway and at the restaurant across the table, that we adopt a biblical spirit of positivity. Amen. Rather than giving in to the pessimism, which is so rampant in our brotherhood today. Folks, I get a lot of bulletin articles. You know, many of you probably get bulletins from all over. And I've gotten to where I just don't hardly look at them anymore because I'm telling you, if we couldn't write negative bulletin articles, I, I think most bulletins would be blank. <laughs> you just don't read a lot right now about, it's going to be okay. We're doing all right. We're going to win. The victory is secured. How many of those titles have you seen lately? You see, what's happened is we live in a time where we feel threatened and despondent. And I understand it. Oh, it's, it's no mystery as to why that's the case. Because when we look around, we see morality on steep decline. We see a time when marriage is not honored and, and it's common to say, my baby's mama rather than my wife. And that discourages us if we allow it to. We see a time of religious compromise, both in the religious world at large, where although there were disagreements, and, and in the past, of course, there were even debates, but it, there was a time when we could pretty much count on the religious world at large for on a lot of really big issues to be at the same place. At least we could start from the same place. But both in the religious world and even in our own congregations, sometimes we, we just ask, why? Where did we come up with this? And I understand why we allow ourselves to give in to that despair, to feel threatened. We live in a world, and in the last few years at this encampment, we've talked a lot about the moral homosexual agenda that's taken place in our country. And you in California experience it 
in a way that we will not experience it in Arkansas and Alabama and Tennessee for another 15 years, but it's coming there too. Because worldly people act worldly. And we shouldn't be surprised, but yet we see that and we feel threatened by it. And so we talk about it and we, you know, kind of let that consume our thoughts sometimes. We look at atheism. We're going to talk about some, that some this week in some of our classes, and it's important to talk about. But when worldly people deny the existence of God, it shouldn't surprise us because the Bible says, the fool saith in his heart, there is no God. And the fool was saying that 4,000 years ago. And fools still exist. We look at irresponsibility. Now, most of you know I'm a police chaplain, and so I ride with cops a lot, and, and I like to ride with the drug and gang task force, and I was with one about a week ago, and we were watching a, a, a known drug house and saw a man come out, and he kind of took off pretty fast down through a gully, and we went around, you know, on the streets to try to cut him off, and sure enough, we found him walking down the street, and the officer and I got out, and we were talking to him, and, you know, we, they, they checked him, and he didn't have anything, ran him for warrants, but in the course of this conversation... The officer was talking to him and he said, listen, I got 11 kids. And the officer said, how old are you? He said, I'm 24. I'm not lying. This is the absolute truth. I'm 24. And the officer said to him, how do you afford the child support on 11 kids? He said, I'm telling the truth with God as my witness. He said to us, I ain't got no job. I don't pay child support. You got a job. You pay my child support. We got back in the car and the officer looked over and said, would it be wrong just to run him over? <laughs> now I'm a chaplain, so I had to answer, yes, that would be wrong. You know, but it made me upset. Does that make you upset? Amen. The people are irresponsible, but he's a worldly man who doesn't know Jesus. Should I expect anything different? No. It should make me sad for him, but it shouldn't surprise me at all. You see, when we look at the world around us, we feel much like Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 23 through 29. As Ezekiel is preaching words of doom upon Israel and Jerusalem, he says in verse, chapter 22, verse 23 of our text, And the word came to me and said, Son of man, say to the land, You're a land that has no rain and no showers. That sounds familiar to you, doesn't it? In the day of wrath. And there is a conspiracy of her princes within her like a roaring lion tearing at her prey. They devour people. They take treasures and precious things and make many widows within her. And then her priests, her priests, they do violence to my law and they profane my holy things and they don't distinguish between the holy and the common. He says, here is a culture where her princes, her politicians, her leaders, they're corrupt to the core of their being. And her priests, those who claim to be religious leaders and have the answers to people's emotional difficulties, they're corrupt and they just care about what they can get from people. And he goes on and he says that her officials, verse 27, within her are like wolves tearing at their prey. They shed blood and they kill people to make unjust gain. And her prophets whitewash these deeds from them by false vision and lying divinations. They say this is what the sovereign Lord says when the Lord has not spoken. So even those folks who should be a beacon of light and right in a world of darkness, call bad things good and name evil things as righteous. Do we live in a world that does that? <coughs> On almost every issue, they reframe the discussion and call that which is evil good. And so we understand the lament that Ezekiel puts forth here. We understand this condemnation and the frustration and the despondent and threatened feel of God's faithful few. But part of the problem is sometimes we stir it up. 
You know, I've become, and this is a, maybe I should or shouldn't say this, I don't know, I, but I'm, I'm already committed now, so I will. <laughs> Sometimes we as preachers are at fault because if we preach about the negative, we're going to get more amens than if we preach about the positive. <laughs> That's the truth. Just like on the news, everything's bad because it sells better. And in the church, if I walk into your congregation and preach a five-day meeting about... Well, you wouldn't have me for a five-day meeting anymore. We might get two days out of it, okay? But if I come in and I do a meeting, or Paul does a meeting, and it's about this agenda in the world that's happening here, or how we're being threatened in this way, or how this is happening, and, and we need to be watching this, brethren, because we don't know what's going to happen. Let me tell you, we'll get bigger crowds, and we'll get more amens, and we'll gather together, and we'll wring our hands together... And as a preacher, I'll feel like a success. Because you know, fear always, always draws a bigger crowd because people are just looking for a way not to feel afraid. You see, this brings to mind to me this theme, that classic Frank Capra movie that I think all of us have seen and some of us watch every single year at holiday time by the same name. It's a wonderful life. That tells the story of our simple but wonderful hero, George Bailey. And you remember that George, he grew up in idyllic and sleepy little town called Bedford Falls. But he never wanted to stay in Bedford Falls. He found the little town to be boring and he wanted to adventure and see the world. And all that it had to offer. Remember he had a suitcase and he was going to put a sticker on it from everywhere that he went. He had these big, big dreams, but life got in the way. And really self-sacrifice got in the way. It started when he was very young and his brother fell through the ice and he had to dive into the ice to save his life. You remember that? And George, because of that sacrifice, his brother went on to be a war hero, but he, he lost hearing in one of his ears. And it continued when he was a grown man and he was all packed. He was going to travel the world. He saved his money. He was going to travel the world. And then he was going to go to college. A big dream. But then his daddy died. And there was nobody to take over the old building and loan. Unless George stepped up and took responsibility. So he gave up his dreams. He put them on hold. Then he got married in the process and they had a family. And running this little business is a hard way to go. During the Great Depression, it takes everything he's got, even to hold it together, as people march into the building and loan and demand their money. And you remember that great speech? It's in your house, Bill, and it's in your house, Larry. And he holds it together, even though Mr. Potter, who owns all the rest of the town, Remember he calls him in and he says to George, he says, oh, you have it too hard. Let me give you, and he offers him this ginormous salary and promises him the biggest house in town and European vacations, things that George had dreamed about his whole life. But he was never able to have because of responsibility and broken dreams. And you remember his bumbling Uncle Billy who he just kind of rides on George's coattails through everything. But then towards the close or the last third of the movie, Billy takes and he loses $8,000, which in 1949 was a fortune. And the bank examiners are coming. And rather than allowing Billy to take the blame, George again sacrifices and steps up. But he, it's too much for him. He doesn't know what to do because bankruptcy, the ruin of his family, and even prison or in his immediate future. So he does the only thing he knows to do. He goes to the bar and he gets drunk. And in, a, in that moment, he has a fight with a school teacher's husband and he leaves there battered and shamed. And he walks out onto the bridge. And he looks down into the water and considers throwing himself in. And he says, the world would be better with me dead than with me alive. And right before he throws himself from the rail, he prays a little prayer says, I don't know, show me the way. I don't know what to do. Show me the way. And I think that's a fairly good commentary of how we're tempted to feel at times in this world. Because really most of the story 
of that classic movie is about a story of broken dreams and feelings of insignificance. That's his problem. His dreams are all crushed. Everything he thought he wanted never is realized. And then he feels like he's a nobody in this little no place. And we understand that. Because every one of us have felt those emotions of brokenness. Every one of us have felt like David after his sin, who he cries out, Create in me a clean heart, O God. And is broken over his sin and his weakness. Or like the Apostle Paul who says in, in Romans chapter 7, that's a text we just don't preach very much. We preach a lot of Romans chapter 8. I wish the chapter division wasn't there. But that's how I think Paul originally wrote it. When he says in chapter 7, the things that I would do, those things I doeth not. And the things that I do are the things that I hate. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And he talks about the weakness and the struggle of being human and wanting to do right and loving the Lord with all of our hearts, but continuing to struggle with sin. And you can just hear the agony in his voice until chapter 8, verse 1, which we didn't have the chapter division to just flow right through. Who will deliver me from this body of death? But therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Amen. who walketh not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see... Paul understood the feeling of brokenness. Every human being, be they an Abraham, a David, be they a, a Daniel or a Joseph or a Peter or an Apostle Paul or a new Apostle Paul, every one of them sometimes feels broken. We all know what that feels like. We look in Job chapter 30, and I think there can't be a better example in Scripture of this expression of brokenness than Job because he truly went to the bottom of life. He was George Bailey in that moment, wasn't he? He lost. Now, George Bailey, he was afraid he'd lose everything. Job really did lose it all. And he says in chapter 30, verses 24 and following, he says, Surely no one lays a hand on a broken man when he cries in help of his distress, have I not wept for those in trouble? Has my soul not grieved for the poor? Yet when I hoped for good, evil came to me. And when I looked for light, then came darkness. The churning inside me never stops. The days of suffering confront me. I go about blackened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. I have become a brother of jackals and a companion of owls. My skin grows black and peels. My body burns with fever. My harp is tuned to mourning and my flute to the sound of wailing. Brokenness. And then sometimes we feel like George Bailey. We feel insignificant. We think of men like Moses who, after he kills the Egyptian and runs in fear and cowardice for his life, and he spends 40 years in hiding as God comes to him and tells him, you're the man, you're the deliverer, you're the one who will lead my people. Moses does everything in his power to talk God out of it. And then we look at Gideon. Much the same story repeated as he's, as he's pressing his weed in the wine press so not to be seen by the enemy. Hiding in cowardice and fear, feeling insignificant and low, like he and his people are truly nothing in the world. He even says in Judges 6.13, But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all of his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring you up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and has put us into the hands of of Midian. He says, we are insignificant. And I am insignificant. You see, these are the emotions of defeat, of pessimism, of despondency. These are the emotions of the enemy. They're the feelings of the devil. And we struggle with them. 
But you see, we have to ask. As we recognize that Christianity is not all roses. In fact, he tells us all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely. For great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Uh, Difficulty is part of the Christian life. So this idea that pop culture would put forth that everyone just needs to don't worry and be happy, as if we can paste on a smile and talk ourselves out of any feelings of, of hurt or remorse. We know that's not real. But we also know that in Scripture, happiness and joy are different things. They're different. And if asked what a wonderful life means, what does that mean to you? Wonderful life. How would you define it? Well, the devil would define it through the voices of all of those who live around us. He would define it as wealth or as things or as love or as a good job and all sorts of different pride, You know, fame, power. But how do you define wonderful life? Jesus actually defines it in Scripture. His definition is in John 10.10 where he uses a slightly different word than wonderful. Because he says the thief comes in to kill and destroy. That's what despair does. That's what all of these things that we look to and fear that causes us to focus on them and lose our attention from Christ and the cross and the victory and the whole message of the book of Revelation. That's what they do. They're thieves. They come in and steal and destroy our joy, our optimism, and our sense of victory and assurance. He says that thief comes in to steal and to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. That's the word Jesus uses. And what I think it's important for us to note is that Jesus uses a specific word. Some of your versions will say to the fullness, but I love that word abundantly. Because what Jesus did not say is I have come that they may have life and that they may have life adequately. There's a vast difference between adequate and abundant. Adequate is McDonald's. I mean, it gets the job done unless you eat it every day and then adequate is a four bypass, right? But adequate is McDonald's, but abundant is... Dinner at my grandma's house on Sunday afternoon. You understand the difference? Adequate is, you know, spending time with folks from work and they're good folks and having a little bit of fellowship there, but abundant is being at the Tahoe family encampment. And sometimes we live like Jesus promised adequacy. And He didn't. He came that we might live an abundant life. Life that is more. A life that is fuller. A life that is not dependent upon the circumstances of the world around us. A life that is truly wonderful in ways that the world around us cannot understand. With that peace that surpasses all of their understanding. You see, the reality is, is life is about perspective. Understanding whether it's good or bad. Looking out there and feeling a sense of fear. But He hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. So what's the difference? Because the circumstances don't change. The difference is lenses. It's how you see it. I've done some mission work in Africa, Central America, other places. And the last little trip where I led a team from congregation in Alabama to Guatemala, 
we were there and we had a great time and we, we worked on homes of the members there with dirt floors and tin roofs and for a bunch of middle class teens and college age from the United States, it was an eye-opening, changing experience. But one of our, uh, in fact, the song leader that came with me, he really was moved by the experience. Never been in a third world country before. And, and his response when he came home, I, I had to do a little correcting. Because those of you who've been in mission fields, you know that some Americans respond this way from third worlds. They come home and they want to talk about how bad we are and how wonderful it is on the mission field. I mean, anybody ever heard brethren kind of do that? In other words, you know, they're so spiritual because they have nothing and they love the Lord anyway. And we're so carnal because we have air-conditioned church buildings and, and Lexuses to drive to church in, you know, and all that kind of thing. And, and I mean, he was kind of going on and on about it, almost as if we should feel guilty. And yes, we do have problems with materialism, but I had to point out to him. I pulled him aside and we talked a little bit and I said, brother, I understand what you're saying. And there's, there's an argument to be made there. But before you're too hard on us, you need to change your lens. You know, the whole time we were in Guatemala, about 10 days, there was about 10 airplanes a day that came into Guatemala from out of country. And 9 out of 10 of them came from guess which nation? The United States of America. And you know, most of those planes, there were a few businessmen that got off from the first class section, but most of those planes were filled with people who had shirts that said, Relief Fund. Or t-shirts that said something about, you know, Middle Tennessee Church of Christ, Mission Team. Or they had t-shirts that said something about Red Cross. Plane after plane after plane after plane all from the United States of America. Do you know how many planes I counted from France? How about, what's some of the other rich countries in the world? How about Germany? How many mission teams do you think came from Germany to Central America in those 10 days? How about from Japan? Or how about from, do you understand my point here? This country has some serious problems, but it is, to this day, the most generous nation that has ever existed. And it's all about how you see it, isn't it? Whether you're looking for the good stuff or whether you just become so consumed with all the bad. When we look around us, what lens do we wear? When we look around us at this new postmodern generation that's coming up, oh, there's a lot of things we could look at and focus on and be very, very critical, rightly so, of. But you know, there's some good things too if we look with the right lenses. When we look at our world and, and a lot of the political ideology that is just so contrary to the will of Christ, we could focus on that. But if you look, there's some good things too. And I'm not saying we ignore or we wink at the bad. That's not the point. The point is, is how we see things. Not that we compromise truth or that we stop trying to teach others or bring them to a biblical understanding. I'm talking about how we feel about ourselves. When we look and we, we, we perceive from all the wickedness that the devil is winning, then we feel like losers. But when we look beyond with the right lenses, the lenses of faith, then we realize it's just the attempts of a desperate enemy who has already lost the battle. He's already lost the war. You see, we need to see things clearly. George Bailey, he doesn't end there on that bridge. And we won't promote the theological implications of all of that movie, but the principle is profound indeed. Because in the film, he is encountered by a bumbling but adorable guardian angel named Clarence. And Clarence grants him his wish. And he says, you think life would be better if you'd never been born? Let's find out. And he walks him through an alternate reality. A reality in which George Bailey never came into existence. And these are the changes that he sees. His brother is dead because he died falling through the ice. Because George wasn't there to save him. He goes and his wife, his sweet wife, who's been an adorable mother and wife, 
and a helper. She is a lonely spinster and an old maid. His uncle, Billy, bumbling but adorable, who's thrived under George's wings. He's in an insane asylum and lost his mind. And then, of course, the town of Bedford Falls, that idyllic, beautiful, quaint little community is now Pottersville, with bars on the window and a sense of doom and dread in everyone's heart. And as George Bailey sees through a different pair of lenses, he cries out, I want to live again. I want to live again. And you know the conclusion as he goes home and he says, I love you, you old building alone, and I love you, you old lamp post, and all the different things that he, that he cries out in his joy as he goes home with a new perspective, new lenses, a new outlook on life. Nothing had changed. Everything was exactly as it had been. But he, he had changed because he saw it differently. So he went home and he hugged his wife and his children and then his friends start pouring into the house and they heard about his troubles and they bring him their savings and they bring him their extra. And then his friend from long ago that he'd forgotten about who had built a big business wires in any amount of money he needs. And then he sits there and his brother comes in and says, to my brother George Bailey, the richest man in town. All because of perspective. You see, there are some scriptures that teach us valuably what this means. In Ezekiel chapter 22, where we studied a little bit earlier, and we're closing down. But in Ezekiel chapter 22, we see that God is one who, even in the midst of all the bad, remember what it talked about the princes and the priests and, and, the, and the, even the leaders of the land, they're wicked and it's from top to bottom, from richest to poorest, from greatest to least, they're wicked, but what does God say? Does He look at that and focus on the wickedness? Look at verse 30. But I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap. In all the wickedness, in a world of wickedness, just like He had in the flood, when all He could find in a world of millions was eight, God was looking for the eight. In this world where the entire nation had become corrupt and wicked. God was looking intently. He had the right lenses on. And He was searching for the good in the midst of all the bad. You see, there's so much good. In Romans 8, 37-39, it tells us, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are victors, and when we see it through that lens, folks, there's a lot of good in this world, and there's more good that can be done if we'll stand in that gap and be that light that the Lord is looking for. And when we look around us, the question... The world ain't going to change based upon what lenses we wear. It'll change based upon what we do, but not what lenses we wear, but we will change based upon how we see it. You see, sometimes when you find beauty among ugliness, it's even that much more beautiful, isn't it? One lovely rose amongst a field of roses is pretty. But one lonely rose in a barren land is magnificent. Look for the magnificent. Look for the wonder in this world because it's there. And I think of the words of that king of jazz as he wrote the song that all of us will remember. Entitled, I Say to Myself, what a wonderful world. And if you'd indulge me, I'd like to change just a couple words in the song. I see trees of green and red roses too. I see them bloom for me and for you. 
And I say to myself, what a wonderful God. I see skies of blue, clouds of white, the bright blessed day and the dark sacred night. And I say to myself, what a wonderful life. All the colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of the people passing by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? Well, what they're really saying is, I love you. I watch, I hear babies crying, and I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. So I say to myself, what a wonderful God. And yes, I say to myself, what a wonderful life. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. This morning, if you focused with the wrong lenses, and it's about who you are and what you feel about yourself, you can go to church every Sunday, be faithful, and still live a life of despair focusing on all the bad. If you've been looking at life through the long, wrong lenses and you need to make a change this morning, and you want to say, Lord, from this day forward, I want to go home and I want to be a force of joy and of optimism and of victory rather than a voice of fear and defeat, then don't delay. Come right now as we stand and as we sing.